What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a special September 7th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. We made it through the week, Stu. Holy smokes. Oh, it was a short, long week. How does that happen? <laughs> it really was. We had Monday off, but man, it it feels like, you know, I don't know how we're going to do next week, but we appreciate everybody sticking with us. Excellent show this week. Oil prices just took an absolute tumble. OPEC coming out saying they're not going to they're going to cut production. Now they're not going to cut production. We saw a nice M&A deal here on Thursday and, and and my oh my, there's just much more coming down the pike. Unbelievable. What a day to be in trading. Absolutely. So, all right, guys. Well, as always, the staff picks out some of our top stories throughout the week. So I will go ahead and turn it over to them. But first, guys, as always, all the news and analysis that you heard is brought to you by EnergyNewsBeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team, again, always do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Hit that description below for all the links to the timestamps, links to the articles, and, you know, just again, Again, if you want to hit us up on Substack, the energynewsbeat.substack.com, you can also hit invest in oil.energynewsbeat.com for exclusive access to our direct working interest prospect that we are partnering up with Hakos Country Operating and our friends over right. there on a great opportunity. Um, but really, guys, hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy the weekly recap. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the team, and we will see you on Monday. Saudi Arabia expected to cut its oil prices to Asia for October. Uh, Michael, I've always said I've applauded the Saudis for taking care of Saudi Aramco first and Saudi Arabia first. You know, if every country watched out for themselves, it'd be a better world. Saudi Aramco is the world's top crude oil exporter is expected to cut the official selling price osp michael official selling price is an osp i love that acronym you know that it's like wow osp what in the hell was an osp official selling price of all its crude grades to asia in october including the survey of five revining services sources three of these reuters expects the flagship saudi grade arab light to be at 50 to 70 barrel lower than the september um it's pretty amazing when you sit back and take a look where this is also playing out is you're seeing Russia. I am shocked is applying and they are looking at their production numbers to match the OPEC plus production cut. I'm like, Whoa, excuse me. Russia's going to try to play in that and be and and follow the production cut. No way. Well, it's because it's being clear that sanctions don't work and they don't need to abide by whatever the sanctions are because they can just they're getting whatever the market price is. So we'll leave that at it be. But, yeah, I mean, this is pretty expected for October. It looks like demand is coming in slightly weaker than we would have thought. Obviously, there's still a demand. Demand is growing on a month over month basis, but we're not seeing the 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 growth, the margins on the margins, it's going a little bit down. So, you right. know, it's only a 50 to 70% cut or a 50 to 70 cent cut. So I wouldn't read too much into that. Obviously, this has a little bit to do with the fact that some of these other countries are it's being widely acknowledged now, not just in the inner circles like this podcast and other ethers out there. But now it's being officially mentioned by OPEC that people really aren't following the you know output quotas that OPEC has put out there. There's something to be said and, and, and talk about rumor, the rumor mill spicing up. Still. I mean, there's a lot of interesting analysis out there saying that Saudi's getting ready to actually turn the taps back on, which would right. be great for the consumer. We'd see oil prices go down uh, precipitously. It would be devastating to the U.S. shale business, obviously, as they've basically slowly... African state joins BRICS Bank. If they were going to, let's put a little conspiracy th theory hat on, Michael, and you love, you know, I love a good conspiracy theory. I didn't, wait, it, you, you're putting the hat on? I figured you, you hadn't, you haven't taken it off in months. Oh, no. I, oh, but you were putting the hat on, not me. No, I'll put it on. I'll put the conspiracy hat on for us. And, and we, we take a look at BRICS. African state joins BRIC Bank. Algeria says its admission to a significant step to the further integration of the global financial system. This is huge because guess who else has stepped up and has applied to this? Turkey. 
Turkey is absolutely a mess. And, you know, with them being in NATO and all of the problems that Turkey is problem, this is a major thing. So the conspiracy theory would say is if the U.S., if Saudi Arabia wants to mess with the U.S. dollar, once these other countries pile into BRICS monetary system and they plunge the oil market, what is it going to do? It's going to really hurt the U.S. dollar. Yeah. Now, I mean, on, on, on the backside of this, you know, Algeria, as this article points out, is a, is a long standing, has a long standing alliance with Russia. So I can imagine a lot of what's the quote unquote new economic development that's going on in Algeria is really their close ties oh. with your friend Putin and the Kremlin up there. Oh, absolutely. Um, Russia is is all over Africa like we should be. Putin is a better political leader than the United States. Do I agree? We'll, no. we'll disagree on that one. But uh, who's winning countries' hearts and minds? Russia. I don't know if Putin I don't know. If, I don't know if anybody should be. I, countries should be allowed to govern for themselves, not exactly. influenced by other countries. But he is selling Russian products to Africa on unbelievable volumes. Mm -hmm. And, and so China's that, just building infrastructure around the around the globe to be nice. No, I mean, the, come on. Everything comes with an attachment. It, it does. And we're not doing anything other than messing with people. I'm not country. saying we're the I'm not saying we don't put, you know, you know, military bases for free in other countries just for the sake of it. I, I I'm saying you know, when, when we talk about who's winning the global influence, I mean, it, that's like a catch-22. It's like, who's murdering the most people? It's like, I don't know. I wish nobody was doing any of it. I couldn't agree more. You and I are in 300%. Let's go to the oil rigs or where they were around COVID. This one is from Jeff Kremel. I really like Jeff. Jeff yes. is a cool cat. I found this article on his LinkedIn We've got his LinkedIn and the article in the show notes. A U.S. drilling, let's go through some of these numbers. U.S. drilling rig counts where they were nearly three years ago. Rig counts today are where they were in late 2021. They climbed 33% to the end of 20, from the end of 2021 to the end of 2022. Then they fell 20% and then they've fallen another 6%. And if you look at the chart, you can all go over there and look at that first blump and go, whoop, there's COVID. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. And and you take a look at where prices were relative to where when COVID was happening and the sentiment right. around where where you know prices were gonna go relative to where COVID was to where the yard are. It's pretty unbelievable. You know, it's I love this article that I love this image that he points out. US rig counts are going nowhere while the rest of the economy continues to progress. I mean, you talk yep. about the stock price of both ConocoPhillips, EQT, US non far payrolls, GDP, dry gas production, US crude oil production, all up from a percentage standpoint while u.s rig count is absolutely zero now we've seen it rise and currently fall i just think it's super fast this again goes to show the dynamics of what's going on in the oil and gas industry is 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 tight inflation i think is the big driver of this because inflation hits service companies the most because right. as an operator your goal is efficiency 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 you want to make sure that that your cost is as low as possible Problem is when the cost of materials and specifically the cost of labor has gone up tremendously. And we can that's for another discussion where we talk about what where the cost of labor was, where it is now, and why some of that has happened. It that when labor and so let's not even go into if that's good or bad that labor's gone up. We you could we could bring on people that to talk about both sides of that equation. I'm generally in favor of people getting paid more than less. So that's just right. you know, but the problem is that cost of labor generally gets immediately passed on to the oil companies, okay? So now all of a sudden, if prices have moved slightly, which they have, they've obviously gone up, but if the overall inflationary environment has gone up, that means the overall cost to drill a well has gone up. I can I can speak to it extremely cogently, just having looked at AFEs, having seen AFEs over the last, let's just say, four years to, to, to condense it down, the, the same two-mile lateral has basically gone up 30 to 35 percent sometimes yep. in the range of almost 50 percent your range is probably 30 to 40 percent on the top end it's almost yep. gone up 50 percent from a cost well the the problem is there's if if 
if on average tier one assets are getting drilled up and there's less and right. less availability for the average company, let's just take out the Exxons of the world, the Chevrons, the EOGs of the world. They've got enough tier one, quote unquote, inventory to last themselves. If now all of a sudden you're trying to take 50% higher AFE costs and 25% less productive oil and gas wells on average. Remember, that's on an average basis. You're always going to have wells that perform right. above type curve. You're always going to have wells that perform below type curve. So now all of a sudden, if you're averaging a lower type curve, with a 50% higher cost, you're going to be less incentivized to drill until I would say the stars align. And there's a lot of reasons why you would drill a less productive well at a higher AFE cost. You know, at some point it's what you do as an oil and gas company. You have to you have to do something. But it's part it's also partly why you've seen MA action pick up over the last two years because on average it's cheaper to buy producing assets and just buy the production then try to add it via drilling. And, right. and, and and there's a lot of different reasons for that. So I think it's a convolution of things. I think inflation driving up labor costs was kind of the start of this whole shift to where oil companies have kind of found themselves right now. And and you could see it. Oil prices are up almost a thousand percent relative to, I mean, they were negative at one point. So they're up right. infinitely relative to where they were at negative prices. Um, but you haven't seen rig counts move that much. And I think it's a, it, there's a lot of underlying dynamics, but I think it all goes back to underlying inflation and service companies are really hurting themselves. And, you know, shout out to connection crew and JP yes. Warren. He hosts these great get togethers. I was at one in Fort Worth last week and we were talking specifically about the role, the conversation was really, he does these kind of guided discussions before dinner. We were really talking about private equity and how things have right. changed within that business around the oil. But that really wasn't interesting. I was having a conversation afterwards with, I'll leave the company out of it because I don't want to out them, but it was, it was a director of sales at a leading service company. And he was having a conversation two weeks ago. He was telling me with the CEO and owner of this company wow. and, you know, oil companies use these service companies as piggy banks. All of these companies provide the service up front and then send you an invoice. Right. Well, if you don't pay the invoice. That company, that service company has got to pay the labor. It's got to pay the cost. And you're not paying an interest rate on that. You wait oh. 90, 120 days to pay your invoice. You've basically gotten free service. You've allowed the cash to sit in either your bank to accrue right. interest rates. And he was like, the management team was just complaining that companies are using them as a piggy bank. And BH like, BHP oh, was one of the worst ones on the planet. I will go on record because as it working at a small company and we were putting in 1800 pads here and another hundred thousand, you know, thousand pads there. And then they would say, they sent a note and said, Oh, by the way, we are now going from 60 day pay to 90 day pay. Yeah, and, no, and if, it's if, crazy. You if you have a change order, it adds it, the clock starts again. You're like, what? And as, as that type of company, What's what's the recourse for a service company to there is none. I mean, there unless you're none. Halliburton, hey, unless you're Halliburton and you have a diversification of customers. But let's be clear. Most service companies have two or three companies that they do the majority of the work for. If 90 yep. percent of your business comes from and I'm just picking a company, I'm not saying this company is. Right. But let's just say 90 percent of your business comes from Oxy and Oxy decides to go from 60 day to 90 day billing. And that means they're really not paying for 120 days. Well, exactly. What are you do? Complain to Oxy. They, they they have choice in who they go from. You might not relative to where your inventory, it, it, where all it, of your, your people are. It's less harder for you to go find new customers than it is for a serve or for an operator to go find new vendors. So there is this idea of kind of operator capture in that these oh. vendors have really no choice but to play. Operators know this and chug it along. Ironically, one of the things he was saying is the smaller companies, you know, the non publics or the really the, the smaller family mom and pop shops actually are the better customers to work for because they pay on time. The problem exactly. is there isn't enough volume. And that's where you get this, you know, the, the, the larger service companies like working with the smaller companies because they'll pay on time. But the volume isn't high enough especially if you're a public service company to satisfy the capital market. So you're in this constant tug and war. It, it was oh, a really interesting and, conversation. And project management and documentation and change orders. I lived and died by that. If you didn't have it all in line, you didn't get paid. No, absolutely. And they'll, and they'll fight you because again, they have, they have choice. That's right. 
Biden grants first new LNG approval since freezing permits on my bingo card this morning, Michael. So, no, I did not. New Fortress Energy receives a five-year license to sell LNG, but here's where it gets dicey. The climate groups got upset. Holy smokes, they were like, what is going on? The US DOE, Department of Energy, granted a five-year license Tuesday to Wes Eden's company, New Fortress Energy, which is developing small-scale LNG export known as Fast LNG onshore near Altamira, Mexico is key for U.S. LNG. Here's a quote. It's ridiculous that the Department of Energy would issue this license despite the administration's ongoing incomplete public interest review of such exports, said Mitch Jones, a managing director at Food and Water Watch, a progressive environmental group. The department is now under no obligation to approve these ill-advised proposals now or ever. I got a message for you there, Mr. Mitch Jones. You're welcome on the podcast anytime. Let's talk about how much LNG can actually save the planet in CO2 emissions by getting this out there instead of having your expertise in food and water, which is a waiter, I think. I'm not sure. But if you're a waiter and you're an expert in LNG or carbon, please, I want you on this podcast. How's that? I'm sorry. It's a waiter. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just by reading his bio, it was like, dude, you never graduated college and you're a waiter and you're trying to say, do you know how much carbon in the LNG markets are saving because they're putting coal plants out of business? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I couldn't have said it better. I, I, you know, all I'll add to this is that it is kind of crazy to see the Biden administration's complete 180 on LNG exports. You wonder if it, you know, you wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that he's now a lame duck and he's actually, you know, ironically reading the facts or somebody in his administration is reading the facts. I mean, he got to give credit where credit's due. I'm going to take it and say, yay. I did have to give him a shout out just because he was a waiter. I was a waiter and I was a great waiter. But when you sit back and take a look at this, Michael, I think that they did approve it only because of the Chevron deference that has been going on. They're having to appeal it. And so they, this was one of those, they just threw it out there to shut people up. Well, hey, hey, the way credit where credit's due, we'll take this. Let's go to the Manhattan here. The taxpayer funded illusion of cheap renewable energy. I got to hand it out to uh, on X again. I just said, can you create a picture of cheap renewable energy. And I expect to see unicorns and, you know, fairy dust in this picture. It's a pretty cool looking picture. But anyway, let's go on to the story here. Germany, UK, California, and now New Jersey and New York, or consumer electric prices are double to triple the U.S. average. But what the difference are, their race to convert wind and solar. Here's where the numbers come in important. Later on down in here, it says South Dakota, as is number one, says renewable supply, 95% of the demand, yet the state has ninth lowest energy price. Do duplicity, do publicly available data back that up? No, they don't. Look at Coal's 36%. There's a numbers game problem going on. They've got large hydro there. So on the wind provided 55% of it, and they've got wind. So according to the 77 South Dakota generation, not the 95%. They kind of like excluded the coal. Yeah. I mean, Oops. it's... I just it's, don't look at... You won't see this coal plant. You don't see anything. It's one of the penguins from what, what's that movie? I forget. Oh, the Madagascar. Yes, Madagascar. You don't see anything. It, it's really true. Again, I, I love this quote. The influential academic says renewables alone can halt the climate crisis. Wind, water, and solar can provide plentiful, plentiful and cheap power. He argues ending carbon emissions that driving climate crisis. I mean, I mean, some of these people, these people just say things that there's no basis to be able to even make that quote. Exactly. If it, and I think it's because of who they're, they're getting paid by. And it's almost like everybody that is out there saying they're climate alarmists 
are being paid by somebody. They definitely are being paid by somebody. OPEC. Michael, this has been fun. The Bulls and the Bears have been running amok. You know, who's going to win on whether or not OPEC is going to happen? I saw this one. OPEC plus close to delaying the oil supply. At the time we're recording this, oil has been hammered pretty brutally. The group had scheduled for October production boost or increase of 180,000 barrels, but now they're rethinking it because of the data from China. I thought that was pretty interesting. Here is a quote from Bob McNally. OPEC is facing a binary choice between delaying tapering and enduring a disorderly crude price route, said Rob, Bob McNally, president and consultant of Rappian Energy Group, a former White House official. It appears to be leaning toward the former, as he's always cautioned it would be the case. Yeah, it's... I mean, we've kind of seen the 180 on this. I think it's because they saw Brent oil prices, you know, as we as we sit here, Brent oil <laughs> prices have dipped to to pretty low. I mean, you're talking about $73 70. Brent, which is not nearly what they need. Now, I think the entire break even oil price charade that Saudi needs, yes, they need higher oil prices, but they can also just roll back a lot of their spending, which I think people don't know it, about. Right. You bet. And so now Ananias has been saying that that's the sweet spot. So it's kind of funny that they're rolling right on into the sweet spot. Yeah, but, you know, the, the 180, I think, comes as which obviously they would like higher prices. I think, you know, it, it's it, it clearly shows that the market is on a little bit more of a tenuous situation than I think anybody wants to admit. So it'll be interesting yep. to see how this plays out. And we will be watching very closely this next OPEC meeting coming up. Oh, absolutely. Four years ago, do you remember the OPEC you and I were pretending we were at? That was a funny video that we we made where we were like all in there on the Zoom and we made it. Was, that was great. The, anyway, that was, that was some of the old fun days. A rare metals price surge as China restricts exports. Now, Michael, this is in the critical minerals area. You being a mines guy, antimony is not what you pay after you get divorced. Antimony is actually what they use for military, automotive, and solar applications, with China producing nearly half of the global supply, Michael. That is nuts. Now, they're going to say, this is, quote, from London, it's a sign of the times. Military uses of uh, SB antimony are now the tail sign, the tail that wags the dog. Everyone needs it for armaments, so it's better to hang on to it than sell it. You don't want your other your opponents having it. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I love first off this this article is titled correctly: rare metals, not critical metals, because right there's there's a difference there. There is, and it's really critical minerals versus metals per se. But you know, it's it's absolutely going to be pretty crazy when China and now Russia, who have both gone in to all of these countries, including now Afghanistan, and hoovered up all of the critical mineral, minerals and metals that are needed to make EVs and selling it to us as a premium. And then we all turn around and say, look how green we are. And we're not. Yeah. Listen to this. Last year, China issued three batches of rare earth output quotas. The first time it issued more, that more than many quotas in a single year since it started the quota system. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. And it just means that if we don't get our regulatory issues, we our regulatory issues cost us over a trillion dollars this year. Because if we don't get our regulatory mining issues under control, we won't have an energy transition. Yep. I, I was listening to a podcast this morning with Cash Patel, who's advisor to President Trump and somebody who's a former chief of staff to the secretary of defense. And he said, it's the modern, you know, these minerals, lithium, cobalt, and they're all the modern day blood diamonds. That's exactly right. And, but you got to have it for energy because- oh. It's necessary. Don't get me wrong. But and you're not going to grow the grid twice. I mean, we're supposed to double the, the Texas grid in five years without this. It takes 20 to get a mine open. It ain't going to happen.